of an eastern mystery cult of the sun, which was worshipped at Emesa in the form of a black conical stone that was believed to have fallen from the sky. The name of this sun god was Elagabalus, and it was this name that Antoninus took for himself, and by which he is remembered in history. He made it his mission to dis displace Jupiter from his place at the head of the pantheon with the god Elagabalus. He only slightly softened the project by using the Latin name Deus Sol Invictus, the divine undying sun. He had the black stone brought to Rome with some pomp. It was delivered on a chariot pulled by six white horses. Elagabalus and his ministers preceded the rock, walking backwards to fully enjoy its blessings. It was set up in a splendid new temple erected on the Palatine Hill for the purpose. It became a scene of the most costly and elaborate sacrifices. Rich incense was burnt, while a chorus of Syrian devotees performed sensual dances. The most prestigious of the citizens of Rome were required to attend, unwillingly implicating them in the overthrow of their own tradition. Elagabalus was intent on creating a new religion for the Roman Empire by fusing his cult onto the traditional pantheon. This required the disrupting of old practices and looting the treasures of the established temples. He had the Ancilla placed in his newly built Temple of the Sun. The Ancilla was an ancient artefact that was supposed to have been the belt of Numa, the famously pious king of Rome. This was claimed to have fallen from heaven and to be sacred. The Palladium, the very soul of the city, was also moved. This ancient image of Athena had been brought to Rome from Troy by Aeneas, the legendary founder of the city, around a thousand years before. He was meddling with the most venerable of the objects in Rome. To fully integrate the new god of the sun into the Romans' extensive existing crowd of gods, Elagabalus set up a wedding with the moon. The go-to place for moon worship was Carthage, where she was known as Astarte. The image of Astarte was transported across the Mediterranean to symbolise the union. This gave another chance for a massive ceremony and a public holiday. Elagabalus was obviously in his element and having a ball. His upturning of the traditional religion did not stop there. He also married a Vestal Virgin. This was really not what you were supposed to do. You know, read the label. Marrying a Vestal Virgin would have been quite enough on its own to shock a pious Roman to his core. The prescribed punishment for a Vestal Virgin who failed to keep her vows was being buried alive. They took this sort of thing very seriously. But there was more. He also married his charioteer, Heracles, whom he described as his husband, and who he publicly announced as having the authority of the emperor. And this was still not all. He had many other lovers of both sexes, and to some of them he gave out the, the prestigious post that the more regular citizens might have expected to receive themselves. Now, homosexuality wasn't viewed as an absolute outrage in the way the Victorians did, but it wasn't freely accepted as simply the way someone is, as we do nowadays either. It was perfectly acceptable for an emperor to have male lovers, but it wasn't okay for them to take the passive role. Caesar was widely mocked for a story that he had once done so with an eastern potentate. Elagabalus made no secret of his inclinations. He even dressed in women's clothes. It's hard to think of a taboo he had left unbroken. Elagabalus was the first emperor of Asian origin, and for Gibbon, being Asiatic was synonymous with effeminacy and decadence. In Gibbon's time, the whole of the Middle East was occupied by the Ottoman Empire, a despotic power with a mysterious sultan hidden from public view with his harem and eunuchs in a secret area called the Seraglio, so there was a sort of justification for Gibbon's prejudice. Now, as it happened, effeminate and decadent were two extremely apt adjectives to describe Elagabalus. He would have struck a strange figure to the Roman eyes, and indeed quite strange to modern eyes as well. As Gibbon puts it, his head was covered with a lofty tiara. His numerous collars and bracelets were adorned with gems of an inestimable value. His eyebrows were tinged with black, and his cheeks painted with an artificial red and white. The grave senators confessed with a sigh that, after having long experienced the stern tyranny of their own countrymen, Rome was at length humbled beneath the effeminate luxury of Oriental despotism. OK. The Romans were probably not seeing things quite this way. The ascribing of virtues and vices to geographical areas would have seemed as strange to them as it does to us, but they certainly didn't like Elagabalus. His behaviour must have been profoundly shocking, 
particularly his undermining of the centuries-old religious foundations of the state. His new rights must have seemed a bit like having Alice Cooper taking over a cathedral. Indeed, with his outrageous appearance, he must have looked a bit like something out of a heavy metal video. Discontent with the dangerous young foreign weirdo grew and grew rapidly. Julia Mesa was still behind the scenes and trying to pull the strings, but Elagabalus was uncontrollable. But she was nothing if not shrewd, and realised that as Elagabalus was rapidly losing the respect of the Romans, she needed to do something. Luckily, she had a backup. She got Elagabalus to promote her other grandson, Alexander, craftily renamed Alexander Severus, to the role of co-emperor. As you would expect, this didn't work very well. Wielding sole power is very much the whole point of being an emperor. Elagabalus was soon trying to get rid of Alexander. His ineffectual attempts to do so had the effect of giving the anti-Elagabalus feelings a solid grievance to coalesce around. Alexander was to be the undoing of Elagabalus. He issued a decree demoting his cousin, and this was the trigger for open rebellion. The Praetorians refused to obey his instructions. In fact, they put themselves forward as the protectors of Alexander. They promised to use their power to make sure his rights were respected. The direct approach having failed, Elagabalus tried being devious. He gave out completely false information that Alexander had died. It's far from clear what he hoped to achieve by this. What he actually did achieve became clear very quickly. The troops suspected that Alexander had been murdered and stormed the palace to take their revenge. Elagabalus was killed along with his mother. His mutilated body was dragged through the streets amid jeering crowds and thrown into the Tiber. He was 18 and had ruled Rome for four remarkable and colourful years. Gibbon concludes, His memory was branded with eternal infamy by the Senate, the justice of whose decree has been ratified by posterity. I'm not sure Gibbon has it entirely right here. Posterity has tended to ignore rather than condemn Elagabalus. I think it's because he was basically a sort of one-off, a kind of interlude in the run of history. His religious reforms were not part of any pattern. In fact, they seem to have been spontaneous ideas that he just made up as he went along. They didn't have any particular long-term effect. I often think of Elagabalus when I see odd-looking teenagers hanging around in shopping centres. You dread what sort of party they might, they might throw while their parents are away. Think what would happen if they were left in charge of the world for a few years. That's pretty much what the reign of Elagabalus was like.